Well, hi, everybody. It's the Week in the Tackle podcast, the podcast where we look at the previous week in the world of soccer and or football and um, tackle it. I'm Tom Rennie, the host of the programme. Alongside me is a fellow host and also a legend on all things MLS and broadcasting, specifically broadcasting every single game for Apple, it seems, in between mm-hmm. flights around the country. It is the legendary Mr. Dunny, Brian Dunseth. How are you, mate? You are right? You were somewhat correct, Tom Rennie. I do fly across the country with Apple TV, but I took a break. I took a break. I suggest that everybody at some point after listening to us two shenanigan, hooligan, knuckleheads, look up a place called Bear Lake. Bear Lake. Mm. Okay, Bear Lake. here we go. Bear Lake. Is this where you go bare ass for the week? I did not. I, d- I did not. I had shorts on, but uh, the, it is one of the most beautiful places that one could find within a two hour drive of Salt Lake City. And we, we had the weekend off. We took advantage of Labor Day. I took the weekend off from work and uh, pulled the trailer up there, parked it. We had a fantastic time with the kids. So, yes, but no. Taking the trailer to Bear Lake is, quite mm. frankly, the most American thing I've heard anyone say mm. in my entire life. What did you do the weekend? Oh, we took the boys and the trailer up to Bear Lake. It sounds yeah. like something from a Yogi Bear cartoon. Mm. I'm super yeah. into it. Uh, yeah. Bear Lake, by the way, is a natural freshwater lake on the Idaho-Utah border in the western United States, or it was a freshwater lake before Dunny got in. Uh, right. That's <laughs> what you did with your weekend. What I did with my weekend is, firstly, I worked on the game between Newcastle and Brighton, which we might touch on here. We might not. I think there's some interesting bits in it, but we have a, a finite amount of time. The other thing I did was go to Emirates Stadium in North London to enjoy the treat of Arsenal against Manchester United. And look, we're a couple of days on, so we won't delve too much into the minutiae of the game. There's some interesting bits from it, but the, the fallout, Dunny... Yeah. We're into Tuesday now, and, and the fallout continues. That There's Arsenal bits I do want to get to, uh, and I would like to talk about uh, Declan Rice for a few minutes because I thought he was absolutely phenomenal yeah. in this game, not just the goal and the moment and his incredible handling of fans and the media. I mean, it, it was it's kind of shades of what Jude Bellingham is doing at Real Madrid in a way. It mm. almost looks like he was he's always been there, but Real Madrid might win things. So it's not exactly the same. Um but Man United, I mean, i got to get your view on Manchester United because regular listeners will know, but not everyone will know. I know we've got a lot of new listeners in New Zealand at the moment, and welcome to you. Thanks for subscribing and listening. You can watch it on YouTube, by the way, should you wish to see what we look like. Um, but you're a Man United fan, yeah. uh, long-standing from afar and indeed in the country as well. And before the season began, I maybe even more than you, had a lot of positivity about Manchester United and and the way that the season might go. Potential title challenge, but certainly it felt like the club was going in the right direction and there'd be a a building on last season. The first four weeks have been pretty dire. And this weekend, I mean, I hate to do the whole this is Manchester United football club thing, um, mainly because it's ridiculous how many times former Man United players do it when they lose. Oh, it's the Glazers' fault. We'll maybe get to that. But... The way they played against Man United, that's our Wolves set up. That's our Bournemouth set up. And the sheer trying to house your way, sorry, Tim, to a draw at Arsenal, which nearly worked. It, I mean, it didn't pay off in the end. And when you play like that, Dunny, and don't win, it does look really bad, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly disagree with you. I saw your whole narrative on Twitter or X or whatever the hell we're calling it nowadays. Um, I don't think it's nearly been as bad as people are trying to make it out to be. I, for one, am not hitting the panic button. I know that if you go back and you watch the games and try to be as neutral as you possibly can, which you are incapable of, obviously, um, that you would see that the game against Tottenham, Tottenham, they should have scored three goals in the first 45 minutes. It should have been Bruno with two. It should have been Rashford with his header. Um, And the game looks dramatically different. Goals change games. And that's the issue right now for Manchester United. Um, Again, as they continue to work players in, trying to figure out what their roles are, how they're going to play, and obviously what Eric Ten Hag is trying to do with this group. Uh, Even against Arsenal. I mean, what what are we talking about? A butt cheek keeping uh, Garnacho in an offside position and drastically could have been a different conversation. No, oh. no. See, now this is what you do. You go, oh, we're going to say it's it's going to blame the referee. No, I'm saying oh. he was offside and the goal was rightly called back. But these are the moments where if you're up to one with 
eight minutes remaining, all of a sudden yeah. it's a completely different game. Yeah, if you but win the tournament, you win the tournament. If you score the goal, you win the game. Oh, uh, look you at know, the West if, Ham fan. We're happy. Are, we've got we, we're top of the table. Stop, we're a good look time. at you. What about it? Every time all you, everything's every this, time. everything's that. I'm trying to tell you. Let me every finish. Every time then. you're wrong, you start you doing do a bit of what about it. Chirp, chirp, chirp. You what about it? Chirp, chirp, chirp. No. Back to the conversation. If Lissandro Martinez doesn't go out, then all of a sudden you're having to turn to slaphead Harry Maguire. Then you're turning to Johnny Evans. All of a sudden, the idea of closing out a game in the final five to ten minutes of a game looks drastically different than what we're talking about if Lissandro Martinez and Rafael Varane or even Victor Lindelof are on the field. All of these can be true and be realities at the same time and not be excuses. So where they're at, listen, it's a phenomenal goal from Declan Rice. Obviously, the Gabby Jesus goal is a counterattack where you're trying to push forward, get numbers. Maybe you can sneak a point with that late time goal. I'm not as concerned as you're trying to make it out to be. Mm. Oh, Manchester United are fucking terrible. Sorry, Tim. All they do is set up to counter. Who cares the way a team sets up? The reality is not every team is Manchester City. Not every team is going to try to play the way Brighton plays every single time. We do this thing where we say, oh, because they're this or oh, because they're that. We expect the eyeball test to be so much significantly greater. They're just going to pass and move and ticky talk and be the best team in the world. It's not how the game's played. So wow. you can sh- all over Manchester United. Sorry, wow. Tim, if you choose to, I choose not to. Wow. That was the I single most... Case. That was the single most defensive answer I've ever heard in my entire life. That well, was like just getting caught. You. That I was like getting caught under X. the sheets with the neighbor and telling the wife, "Is dinner ready?" That was like putting your hand in the cookie jar, Is covered, could it covered in chocolate chips, and saying, oh. "No, I didn't put my hand in there at all, let alone eat them all." That was mm. just extraordinarily defensive, extraordinarily mm. defensive. Weird um, which goes to show you're very worried, which I'm enjoying immensely, and long may it continue. Huh? Um, let me ask you a serious question now about Eric Ten Hag, because look, counter-attacking play is a perfectly acceptable way to, to set up if you, you do it well and don't get beat. If not, it can look a bit ugly. And I know there are Man United fans out there who ain't happy with being set up in that way. It might be mm. similar to Tottenham fans who are feeling a sense of freedom now under Ange Postacoglu. They didn't feel under Conte, Mourinho and and uh, the janitor bloke. Um but the the way they set up a side, you know, I had a lot of faith in Eric Ten Hag, and I think Man United had a lot of faith in Eric Ten Hag. Certainly this summer, where it looked like he was almost given the keys to the kingdom, what do you want? He mm. wanted Mason Mount to rebuild his midfield, injured now, can't do anything about that. He wanted Rasmus Hoyland, who I thought looked pretty decent as a kind yeah. of battering ram forward uh, at times during the game, and I think he will fundamentally change the way they attack. But my question to you is a bit about his capital, mm. because. I thought the way he spoke to Sky Sports after the game was a bit like you in that first section, a bit embarrassing, very defensive. Um, <laughs> you know, Garnacho's offside. It's close. It's really 100%. irritating. Yeah. 100%. But he's offside. I mean, I'm sitting in line with it. And I actually did that thing where I was convinced he was onside. And I'm telling people around me, he's on here. He's going to yeah. be on. I'm telling a couple of Arsenal fans too. in the gangway, yeah. he's on here. You're going to be far. You're in trouble. And then he was given offside. For Eric Ten Hag to come out and say, from the angle I was looking at, yeah, it looked like he was onside, and they show the replay <laughs> from where the sky cameras are. That's not where they do the offside line from. It was the equivalent of going to Pisa, holding your arms up against the leaning tower and saying, look, I'm holding the leaning tower up here. Look at yeah. the angle the camera shot is taken from. I just, yeah. it, was, it was pitiful to say that. And then, Dunny, to have this Jaden Sancho fallout mm. where he talks about Jaden Sancho not performing in training, which led to Jaden Sancho's online response, which I'll read yeah. some of briefly here. Quote, please don't believe everything you read. I'll not allow people, basically Ten Hag, saying things that are completely untrue. I've conducted myself in training very well this week. I believe there are other reasons for this matter that I will not go into. And I've been a scapegoat for a long time, which simply isn't fair. You've got hmm. the supposed failure of the transfer window. At the moment, we've not seen Hoyland, so that is the perception. I don't think it will be proved right in the end, but that's where we are. The Sancho fallout, having previously been praised for the way he's treated him, the poor quality football on display in the first four weeks, and then the insanity and painful deflection of his post-match interview. Tell us a bit about his capital right now, Eric Ten Hag. And do you see it waning a little bit following this first month of the season? Yeah, I, I don't. And again, I can understand why why people are, are creating the narrative because 
when you are a manager, I think you and your coaching staff view a day-to-day management of the player different than what the outside sees. So uh, I'll, I'll give you insight to way I, what I've experienced as a player. You have a coach that has to manage the squad. You, at the same time, he and his staff have to prepare the group of players that he feels is best suited for the upcoming opponent, whether that's at home or on the road, dealing with injury and or suspension and ultimately form. Um, you have kind of a, a, a unique balance in where the manager gets to be, if he chooses to, an isolated entity in this system, where then your group of coaches underneath you are kind of the buffer zone, right? They go up and it's Roddy Ra, hey, tap on the butt, you're good, you know, how's your head, how's the fam, everything. So you have this kind of unique dynamic. Also, remember, there's a cultural dynamic as well. What is maybe acceptable in the United States is different than what's acceptable in the Netherlands. What's acceptable in England maybe is different than what's acceptable in, say, Uruguay. So you, you have this cultural element as well. I think at the end of the day, the way the manager will view this as individual performances aren't necessarily between the white lines over the course of 90 minutes. Individual performances, especially when you have squad depth and you have roster competition, that it doesn't matter if Manchester United three years ago paid $85 million for you to come over from Borussia Dortmund. The reality is you're going up against Anthony, you're going up against Palistri, you're going up against Garnacho, you're going up against Rashford, you're going up against Diallo, you're going up against, insert name here. Um, and if you are not, say, in your finishing drill, scoring goals, if you are not in small side, scoring goals, if you are not in full training, closing down space in the manner in which the manager is asking you to be a part of the individual within the collective press, all of those things are little micro mini shots, right? They're little Polaroid shots for the coaching staff and the manager. And on top of it, you think about all of these training sessions are being cataloged from video and then chopped up into pieces where then the individual training coaches, whether it's the goalkeepers, defenders, midfielders, strikers, they can then bring the players in and you're showing all of this. It could even be down to diet and nutrition. It could be down to weight. It could be down to doing your therapy on your own. It could be down to going to the gym and preparation. What time did you show up to training? All of these things are little micro Polaroids that are being put together by the by the manager and the playing staff. So when the manager says this, mm. he believes it. I don't. I, after what has transpired in the last eighteen months with Jaden Sancho, from the mental health side to the person and the play, you separate the player from the person, which is difficult for us, right? But you separate that from the way that I think the club had taken care of him. You got to salute that, right? Mental health is a, is an issue that certain players have to deal with, and what we don't see doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. But not anymore. So he did think that a few months ago, but now he doesn't because he's called it out you massively talk publicly about now. When you, yeah, but when you talk about now, it's like now it's just performance. Accountability and performance has to be a straight line. Has to be a straight line. If you can't train, if anything else is happening, if if you're dealing with the accusations that Anthony's dealing with, if you're dealing with your wife has uh, left the country, if your grandmother has passed away, if your brother's passed away, like all of, if you've missed a wedding, if you missed a birthday. All of those things, you can feel for a player, but mm. at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is performance because the performance each and every day is the accountability that then puts you on the field. So, but Sancho don't agree. Sancho that, don't agree well, with that. that. Doesn't he matter. publicly it, does not agree. He thinks he should matter. be on the bench in front of we, Gore and Mejbri and which is great. Palestri. Which is great. Good for and, him. And Ten Hag says, no, I think he's you're worse than someone I've never heard of. He's got to prove it. So if he's not proving it to the manager... If you decide to do what he has done now, mm. you are going to suffer the consequences. Is this not Mourinho and Luke Shaw? Is this not him picking well, on a player it, to make a point to everyone else? Like he's done it, also with Maguire and he did with Ronaldo. <laughs> he's making a point of his players to get more out of the other players. Well, I mean, listen, is it making a point out of a player or is it holding the player accountable? Because we oh. do the thing. Well, we do, what do the you, thing. What do you think? Because I, I think it's I, clear I, what I think. What do you think? I think he's holding the player accountable. I think he's choosing when at, I don't I don't think he goes into that 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 presser and says, by the way, I'm going to talk about Jaden Sancho today. Hmm. I don't think he does that. I think if he's asked the question, I think there's a there's an acute amount of honesty when it comes to Eric Ten Hag. If you ask him a question, he's going to answer the question or the he's going to give you the answer that he believes, hmm. whether we agree with it or we disagree with it. 
that is what he's going to. I don't think he minces words. I think he tries to protect players as much as possible. I think he will choose his words wisely, but I also think there's that element of he's not performing. It's very matter of fact. This was a very clear cut. It's this or it's this. And right now it's it's not this, it's this. Mm. And so the the only way out of this I I would I would Im- imagine that he's not going to play for a while. I would imagine he's going to be sent to do all the extra training that is in, in, that you're going to have to undertake at this point to get back into the squad. He's now remember th- these are still human beings. There's going to be an element of f- you, bro. Sorry Tim, on both sides. And then how do you overcome that? But in a situation like this, Eric Ten Hag's not getting fired. Jaden Sancho is going to spend the rest of this window, this playing window, until January opens up. Unless he can move to a different country, he's going to be stuck figuring out a way to work back in. Now, mm. there's obvious ways to do that. I remember when Fabio Capello pushed David Beckham out because he wouldn't sign the contract to Real Madrid and said, oh, you've already committed your future to the LA Galaxy. You're not a part of Real Madrid. He worked his tail off, busted his ass, sorry, Tim, and then got himself back into the squad. I, there's ways to come back from this, but I think if egotistically there's a line crossed that that there's the perception that someone's crossed the line and there's no way back, I'm intrigued to see how this plays out because when I read when I read the response from Jane Sancho, I was like, well, okay, well, that this that's obviously not going to work out because if you had the weight of I'm an absolute starter, I'm scoring goals, I'm undroppable, I'm untouchable, and you decide to say that. It's a different element. Yeah. But when you've been widely regarded as a player that has not hit the value of the transfer three seasons ago from Borussia Dortmund to Manchester United, now with all the other variables that have nothing to do with this moment, people are going to judge you on just pure and simply statistics, numbers, games, minutes, assists, goals, danger, uh, all of these things come into play. And I think it's fairly obvious that the player that he's capable of being, we haven't seen that enough no. in a Manchester United jersey. No, that's very true about Jaden Sancho. And I don't think anyone would come on here, even Jaden Sancho, and defend how he has played during his time at Manchester United. But, you know, it's one to watch for us for the next couple of weeks because he's had the fallout now with Jaden Sancho. He's had the fallout with Harry Maguire, the embarrassing way they let David De Gea leave the club. You've got the, the issue with Mason Greenwood, the issue with Anthony, and that's all off the field stuff that at the moment Eric Ten Hag has not had a grip on and those above him. But you couple that with with losses and poor performances, this terrible away form uh, and the ongoing, oh, the sun didn't come up today. Oh, that's the Glazers' fault. Oh, there's traffic uh, in Manchester. I, I, oh, that's the Glazers' see, fault. Look, whether that's that true or not. Crazy. Yeah, well, that, no, well, that stuff, the Glazer stuff drives me crazy because that, that has and, nothing to do with the team. Right but that's now. all coming together at the same yeah. time. And, I know it's the same. You know, it's the same. It's the same tornado all the time yeah. and it's always turning. But the the interesting thing on that, and again, this is this is just from the outside looking in as well. All the players that are quote unquote having issues are, I mean, outside of the David de Gea situation, which I still don't think was handled correctly. If you mm. chose to say that you were going to after Onana, which that deal was not done, it was still going to take a month and a half to finalize, still to hang him out after the the way and the manner in which he handled himself throughout his Manchester United career. David de Gea is kind of the outlier in the conversation for me, because the rest of the ones that you talked about were not players that are starting. Mm. We're not starting players. So these are the guys that, that can puff their chest and say, I'm Manchester United. I'm England international. I'm this, I'm that. But if you're not playing, it doesn't have the same weight for me because at, at the end of the day, the one thing we also have to acknowledge, and I know this is difficult for people to understand or choosing not to, is there still an element of Ten Hag is weeding out the group that he doesn't want? He's mm. bringing in his players. Financially, he's been given the backing to bring in and spend an incredible amount of money. Whether he's hit or he has not, Anthony's not even close to the player that we thought he was going to be, for example, one one single point. But the rest of them, I, I mean, even down to Eric Bailly signing with Galat- Galatasaray on a one-year, like he's still weeding out the players that he does not want. And I would just keep an eye, who did he bring in versus who did he inherit? And I think the inherit part comes into play with some of the guys that are having issues with him or he is having issues with. Mm. Um, 
Tough day for Manchester United. In the end, it was a good day for Arsenal. I, I think that uh, Arteta planned the game really, really well. And look, it was heading towards a draw, but the plan for United was obviously to draw Arsenal on and they did not get sucked in at any point during the game bar the, the Rashford breakaway goal and certainly learned the lesson from that. Um, the way they won the game, you know, Declan Rice's goal, I, I do want to talk about him a little bit because... We were there on on his on his debut at MLS All Star uh, out in DC, and you know what? You and I have had a, a good laugh about Declan Rice over the last kind of few months or so. You've annoyed me greatly about it, as a, from a West Ham perspective, <laughs> but from an Arsenal perspective, I thought that was a game where you can really see why they bought him. Hmm. I think the Crystal Palace game too. You can really see why they bought him. You can see why Mikel Arteta, to use that word again, used up all of his capital. And quite literally, in this case, on bringing this player in, overspending Arsenal's budget on this one player. Because what I thought he brought to Arsenal, the goal, sure, he hasn't been brought in to really do that, but handy if you can add that to your game as well. But there's points during this game where, now when he was at West Ham last season, and the stats bear fruit on this, he was doing all of his job and he was doing Thomas Socek's job as well. Yeah. And I don't want to kind of rag on Thomas Socek here. That, that, you know, Rice was developing into this all-round Brian Robson <laughs> player, whereas he does it exhausted a lot. Whereas um, Declan Rice, you know, when he was a holding midfielder, but like Edson Alvarez is now for West Ham, Socek yeah. made a lot more sense. Yeah. Um, Declan Rice is becoming this box-to-box entity. And watching him the weekend, you watch Martin Erdogan on the right-hand side being terrific. And constantly being available, constantly on the move and, and being a real captain of that team. And then you watch Kai Havertz being exactly who we know Kai Havertz is. I was chatting to people at Emirates Stadium at the weekend. A few pieces published by people I was chatting to about not being able to understand what Kai Havertz is up to at Arsenal and what Arteta is seeing, his vision for that midfield trio. Rice is being Rice, cutting things out, pressing when he chooses, winning the ball back, starting the attack. But also he's being Havertz. He's driving down the left wing. If if Arsenal had a traditional left back, I think they get some real joy down that left-hand side because of what Rice can bring. He's having to do Havertz's job for him. And I wonder, the Rice that I know and the Rice that I think will play for England, defensive midfield, I just wonder whether Arteta might have watched these four weeks as I have and you have and our listeners will have and, and are thinking... They bought a great defensive midfielder, but the more this guy develops from the age of 24 to 28 and hits the peak of his career... Mm they could really encourage him to become everything they think Havertz is. That defensive midfield player, bring in someone like an Edson Alvarez or a Tyler Adams, you know, or whatever. Someone who can do just dirty work only. Yeah. I wonder if they even realise, Danny, the player they might have on their hands there and the player even Declan Rice knows what he might develop into given the right players around him and a team built around him. Because the more I watch him and the more I watch them, you can really see how that works and what yeah. he might become, but also what's missing around him currently as well. Well, I, first off, I think, unfortunately, the injury to Timber um, downplays the quality of the summer that Arsenal had. Because, yes, I, I can understand the Kai Havertz conversation because it's the same Kai Havertz conversation that we were trying to figure out at Bayer Leverkusen. What was his best position? Is it number 10? Is it out wide in the front three? Is it a point nine? Same situation at Chelsea, and now playing in this left-hand side of this three, or midfield three, or interior three, however we're trying to to verbalize it, with Martinelli wide on the left, Zinchenko kind of overlapping or underlapping underneath him. The thing about Kai Havertz is that you know he's a good player. He's, he, his size and his, his pace, his technical ability, he's a very, very good player. But there's these moments... And, and now, and now it becomes kind of a comical moment, right? It kind of becomes he becomes he is the he's one of the punching bags in the Premier League, mm. um, not Timo Werner esque, but to the point where Timo Werner is starting to be referenced on social media when Kai Havertz has an opportunity and just fluffs his lines. Um, I'm not sure how he ultimately fits in and in this system. Obviously, Mikel Arteta rates him at an extremely high level to continue to give him that role in the starting 11. But will he thrive? And I, and I think the tough part right now is Arsenal fans are in the same position that Chelsea fans were in and thinking, well, is he really better than insert name here? Mm. And you look at guys like Trossard and, and like, is he better than a Trossard in that same, same position? I know it's not like for like, but could it be? So we start to do this thing, right? I think the other part 
is Martin Odegaard. Odegaard is such a fucking good player. Sorry, Tim. It's a lot of curses today. Mm. He's such You're a good player. You're flying up today. Did you I sleep? Am, what am, is this? I, I didn't sleep well. Um, and, and then you get to Declan Rice. Here's the thing for me. I, I've I've never I've never just isolated Declan Rice as a six. Yeah, he can destroy and disrupt and close down and do all those things. But I heard somebody the other day and I started laughing about it. But there's like he's more of a fourteen. I'm not talking about Declan Rice. Somebody else. And I was like, what's a fourteen? Like, what's a fourteen? It's, it's the perfect conversation. Uh, it's the perfect combination of a six and an eight. And I was oh. like, I want to punch you in the face right now. Oh, That's no. Just such did, a did, terrible did this person, has this person ever seen another grown adult naked at all? But I think? mean, maybe. Uh, but I get I get what they were saying because it's like the hybrid role. But we do this all the time. By the way, if you ever go to like a coach's convention, they'll come out and be like, oh, I want a true number seven. Oh, oh we're going to do the destroyer pivot six. <laughs> oh, my God. We're going to invert our number 11. Like use this, this use this on yeah. TV this week. Use that oh, for the Uzbekistan it, game. Yeah. Here, they're in zone 13 right now. Look at the collapsing <laughs> space. Oh, yeah, look at Tom Rennie, zone 12. Um, but <laughs> I think with Dec- with Declan, I think there's an argument to be made. He is the best player on Arsenal for these first four matches of the season. I, or at least in the top three of the top performers. I mean, he fits this group perfectly. Mm. Um his ability again to destroy and disrupt and close down and track and cover is all there on display to your point about getting forward. There's nothing different that he's doing with Arsenal. That's different that he was doing with West Ham. And I just Mm -hmm. think he's, he's such a complete midfielder and we'll end up doing the thing where we like compare him to some of the England greats and some of that last generation. We'll say, Oh, is he a Scolzi or is he, is he a, a Carrick or is he a Gerard or is he a Lampard or is he a, you know, like we'll do that thing. Right. But I just think he's such an intelligent player that then has the physical attributes to take it to that next level. Because like now you look back and you think, okay, Granite Shaka, you think about El Nini, you think about Thomas Parte, you choose Declan Rice. If you have to choose out of the four, a hundred percent of the time you choose Declan Rice. So credit to the young man. And, and, and by the way, he's performing at such an incredible level that the whole narrative and the conversation about how much money he was or was not worth mm. heading into the transfer window is completely irrelevant at this point because that's how good he's been. Yeah, and, and I think at the moment you're looking at a perfect career paths. A, walked away from Chelsea. That's funny for all of us. <laughs> uh, B, winning a trophy with a club from the second tier, European trophy, and then leaving on incredibly good terms. Very rare to do. Then mm. getting a whole bunch of money for that club and not walking out on the Matthias Nunez style like a d- uh, and just like being a professional and then leaving at the right moment. Incredible. Sorry, Tim. Um, and then go, is that a sorry, Tim? And then going to a, an Arsenal team on the up and he'll have a good couple of years there. And then he'll get a move to a team who can win something uh, and will hopefully go on to, you know, play with Jude Bellingham at Real Madrid. And that the perfect career path, win the Euros with England. Um, you know, so he's using Arsenal as a really good stepping stone in his career to the very, very top level. And I want to congratulate him on that successful move. Uh, right, let's move on. I, I want to talk a little bit about Jordan Henderson. I, I don't want to do too much on this, but I, I do want to... Get a little bit of this off my chest, Danny, because he's done this interview in The Athletic today, um, published today. And the whole Jordan Henderson story absolutely grinds my gears. It pisses me off because I don't think he has to talk on these topics. I don't think he owes us anything on these topics. And I think Jordan Henderson has made his position pretty clear on the subject of human rights, women's and girls' rights, the rights of gender identity and all that sort of stuff Mm. by deciding to go to Saudi Arabia. Now, Everyone can make their own decision on Saudi Arabia, but as we've discovered from our Saudi Arabia correspondent, Ben Jacobs, multiple times, those that go to Saudi Arabia, the money is incredibly lucrative, but you have to live the way in which the crown prince of Saudi Arabia wants you to live, the way that that country is is governed, and that's what you sign up for. And I don't believe for a second that Jordan Henderson went to Al, whoever the f- Um, sorry, Tim, Um, not knowing what it was like in Saudi Arabia. He knows and he knew, and he's also made himself, for whatever reason, a quite visible supporter of LGBTQ plus rights and gay rights, and he hasn't really spoken much about women's rights, but if there's women in his family, he should feel, in my opinion, as a 
a, a, a white Briton, I feel like he should be offended by the way women historically and right now are treated in Saudi Arabia. And with all that thrown in, I think he was in a position to say, no, I can't do it. And instead, in this interview, he said, quote, I can understand the frustration. I can understand the anger. I get it. All I can say around that is that I'm sorry they feel like that, which is a bullshit politician answer. Sorry, Tim. Horrible thing to say. Again, don't say anything, Jordan. You don't owe us anything. You don't need to speak on this anymore. And you've kind of abdicated your right to do so. So just don't. Um, he goes on. My intention was never, ever to hurt anyone. My intention has always been to help causes and communities where I felt like they've asked for my help. Well, they're not asking any more, son. So maybe stop talking. And he goes on again. This bit is what really, really pissed me off. He said, I do care. I'm not one of these people who goes home, forgets about everything, and is just like, I'm fine. My family is fine. Just crack on. Uh, Jordan. Jordan. Jordan, you've signed for Al whoever in Saudi Arabia and signed up to live under an incredibly oppressive regime. And that, again, that's absolutely fine. If it's in Saudi Arabia and you live by their rules, that's fine. If you want to live under um, these particular rules and you don't believe that women and women, women and girls should have more rights and you don't believe in the rights of gender identity and you, you know, all the stuff that's that's brilliantly reported by the likes of Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, that is fine. You don't have to. You don't, you don't owe me or anyone anything. But I don't get why he's doing the interview. Hmm. I don't see how he could have done it with his previous quite vocal support of, uh, you know, non-straight white males, basically, quite publicly, and going on saying, oh, I, I might wear the rainbow laces. I might not. No, you won't, Jordan, because you play in Saudi Arabia. Like, Danny, I just I hated the interview. He doesn't owe this to anybody. Yeah, He's made himself very clear as to who he is and what he believes in. And to say this is not about money, when it absolutely 1,000% is, that's why you go to Saudi Arabia right now if you're Jordan Henderson. You don't go for career ambition. You go for money. And again, that's fine. But to come and say all this stuff, I found it to be hypocritical. I found it to be disingenuous. I found mm. it to be, frankly, pointless. And it made me think even less of Jordan Henderson than I did before I read it. I thought some of the parts of the interview were disingenuous. Um, in the beginning, it, I felt like it was his ego talking, and I've seen it. I've been a part of it, and I understand when a player's career is coming to the end, um, there's an insecurity that comes along with that, and the difficulty of recognizing that you are no longer the player that you have been and once were, that it's starting to wean a little bit, and that the the manager and his staff have decided to maybe not just upgrade, but go younger in a position where now the the accountability for performance day to day, combined with the performance over the course of the season, combined with just youthful exuberance that could match the technical and physical ability that you have been doing at such a high level for such a long time. Um, that's a tough, bitter pill to swallow. Mm. He had plenty of time on his contract. He could have chosen to stay and fight everything that i've read it screams insecurity to me based on well if they would have just if someone would have said stay if someone would have if just one person would have said stay um and then I, I i just i just read a quote here a second ago where is it i just saw this is from fabrizio romano i just saw Jurgen a few days ago he says he's really happy with the transfer window loves his team this tells me that um, this tells you the players that left, he probably wanted to go and the players that came in, he probably wanted to sign. Well, here's the reality. A manager's responsibility is not to the individual, to the individual player 100% of the time. The manager's responsibility is to cultivate and create a squad that wins. That is his responsibility. If he does not win, he is fired. So while he wants the individual to have success, the collective success is more important. A manager in a club's job is to always strengthen the roster in any way, shape, or form. Even if that means letting go of your proverbial and your, your instrumental and your kind of emotional leader. And I think Jordan Henderson has been and will be always looked at as that during that time. So we take that, we bottle it, we put it to the side. The moment that you choose to go, the moment that a, that an offer comes in, 
as long as it meets the valuation that the club is looking for, then you get the opportunity to choose what your next destination is. The difficulty in this conversation is obviously, well, let me just step back. I think Jordan Henderson is a good dude. Everything that I've seen him do or choose to do or how he has verbalized things previous, I think he's a good dude. I think he found himself in a really complicated situation. Mm. I think he found himself in a situation where he's not as wanted as maybe he thought he, or maybe he's no longer valued in the same frame that he was valued before. Father time is catching up, new blood coming in, Shobasly, McAllister, et cetera. And all of a sudden, hey, if you get an opportunity, I want you to feel, you know, like I, I would assume there's a conversation in there that says, if you get the opportunity where you can play day to day, 100% every 90 minute game, we have no problem with you shaking hands, leaving on great terms. I can assume something like that happens. But then there's that, like, how hard I worked in the offseason to come in and compete, and I thought I was going to get a chance, but then I didn't get the chance. Mm. Th- these, are all, these are all part of the ego, right? Mm. At the end of the day, he had a choice. So the interview now is, I think, a preemptive strike going back into England squad and kind of explaining how it got there. But I do feel like parts, parts of it, I think, are, are real, and I think parts are disingenuous. And if you just put your hand up and say, listen, this was an opportunity for me and my family at this stage of my career to capitalize on what's left in mm. my playing career. I think that actually hits better oh, yeah. than explaining or not really explaining and or avoiding what the reality is of how it looks like from the outside looking in. So difficult all around as I read it. I feel like I'm poking holes through some of the things that he says, but at the end of the day, not my club, not my player. It doesn't represent my country, but this is going to be the difficulty culturally mm. for some countries and fan bases to have to listen to the explanation as to why a player chose to do this and take this opportunity to play in Saudi Arabia. I don't disagree with anything you said, really. I, I just, I think, I think as a footballer, the way you described it, the end of the road, being thirty-three, all that sort of stuff, absolutely. And there's a yeah. finite amount of time to make money in football, and he's got about two years or three years left in it. And I don't disagree with any of that. And the people that do want to go, and the people that have gone, you know, would I go? I don't know. I don't think I would. However, if you do want to go and you want to earn that money and you want to live by the rules of Saudi Arabia and you want to directly work for Mohammed bin Salman, who owns the club directly, because the Ministry of Sport own uh, Al Etifak, uh, which is the club that Stephen Gerrard is the manager of and Jordan Henderson plays for. They are owned directly by central government and are a sports-washing entity for central government. If you want to do it, that's absolutely fine. But you do, unfortunately for Jordan Henderson, relinquish any right to talk about equality and women's rights and gay mm. rights and LGBTQ plus rights and the rights of migrant workers and all that stuff. And he doesn't have to. You don't have to do any of that. You're a footballer. You can talk about football stuff and say, yeah. I don't want to talk about that. And your point I thought was brilliant and exactly right. Honesty is what was required here in this, in this conversation, this interview. It was, you know what? I got forced into a position by COVID, by society, by dint of being Liverpool captain to speak on issues that I didn't really give a shit about, I didn't want to talk about, and I had to kind of pretend to be an ally of these people because that was the position I was in. But in the end, what matters to me is making as much money as possible out of this short career that I have got because I'm gifted at football and I've worked hard to get to the position I'm in. So I've got to Saudi Arabia because there's big money to be made. Yeah. If he came back and said that, yeah, okay, I'd have a feeling about it, but I would respect his honesty. This word salad this frankly offensive way of describing the fact that he feels like he can change attitudes in Saudi Arabia. Good luck with that, Jordan. Like all of this, I think it was frankly embarrassing. He shouldn't have done it. If I was his PR advisors, I would advise him never to speak on these topics again. Enjoy your money, Jordan, because that is where you are now. And that is where you will remain for a large swathe of the football going populace. Um, I want to talk about offsides briefly, Danny. I know we did a big <laughs> um, decision show a couple of weeks ago, which I think we we had to do because they're getting so much wrong at this moment in time. But um, we're going to try and avoid that because we want them to get better. And I, I do think Howard Webb's going to improve things. 
But this weekend, the one at Manchester City, I, I did want to get your take on this from someone who's, who's played at the top level. And indeed, you know, top broadcaster these days, and you do a lot of kind of VAR stuff against your will, I would assume. But this offside, now, if you haven't seen it, folks, basically, it's a header from Nathan Ake. It's the stroke of half time. It's one all between Man City and Fulham. The ball goes through the legs of Manuel Akanji and goes in the bottom corner. Now, there's a long delay. And if you don't know what the rules are or the laws of the game are, a player is in an offside position if they were judged to be interfering with play by playing or touching a ball passed or touched by a teammate, or if they prevent an opponent from playing or being able to play the ball by clearly obstructing the opponent's line of vision, or Mm -hmm. also in that, making an obvious action which clearly impacts on the ability of an opponent to play the ball. Like, you know, being directly in line of sight of the goalkeeper when the shot comes in, or the ball going through your legs, or making a movement as the ball goes through your legs, as if you could touch it. All those things. To me, Dunny, this was clearly an offside offence. I can see why the referee might not have been able to give it on the field because they couldn't see the line of vision. So fine, I'll accept that. I think it's wrong, but I I can take it. I can see why the assistant referee might not have put his flag up because he might have thought, actually, I'll let this play out and give it to VAR. I can't see how this can be reviewed for five minutes by a video assistant referee and an assistant video assistant referee and not give this as offside. To the point where Erling Haaland said, quote, it was offside. I feel bad for Fulham. I'd be absolutely (laughs) fuming. It must be a horrible feeling. Everyone thought it was offside. Mike Dean, God bless him, on the TV thought it was offside. Our commentator on Premier League Live thought it was offside. Erling f***ing Haaland, sorry Tim, thought it was offside. And Mm. yet this was not given as offside. Now, this weekend there was one between Liverpool and Villa. I'm prepared to be convinced that that was debatable. I think you could convince me right now that Salah quite rightly wasn't given offside. And you could also convince me the opposite, that it should be given. So I'm open to subjective interpretation of these things. I don't think this is subjective. So what's the deal here? What's going on? So this is one of the most difficult ones for me um, because I'm trying to take away my experience as a defender and having a player being played in an offside position behind me, but also kind of being in a reference point for a goalkeeper. And I think with what gets lost in this conversation, we get we get we dig into the minutia and we say, well, is he impacted by the player? One hundred percent, a goalkeeper is impacted by a player being in an off- offside position. Which I would say, let's just use let's just use the goalposts in that distance between the goalposts. If a player is in an offside position, it one hundred percent impacts a goalkeeper. Every goalkeeper will tell you, yeah, I could still get to it. Oh, it was on the opposite side but there's still the reference point. You're still playing him. And I had an experience a couple of years ago uh, when Real Salt Lake was down at LAFC. And there was, a, a, I think it was a, a Diamande was making a run. He was in an offside position, but as the ball was being played across, Nick Romano, the goalkeeper, was literally playing to beat him to the ball. It took a deflection on the way in and then it hit the open goal. Nick's not playing. and Nick, Nick doesn't move unless that player's in an offside position, or at least in the build-up to the play, where then he's anticipating having to come out, go to ground, get a touch, and push that ball away. VAR doesn't intervene. The goal stands. And so Howard Webb at the time, I was trying to get in touch with Howard Webb in the game to ask, how am I supposed to verbalize this on camera? Because the reality is, Nick Raimondo never plays the man if the man isn't in that position. So that, well, you know, it was an own goal or whatever, it was a deflection. I was like, but the player's still in an offside position. He's playing the match. So this is my point. These reference points between the posts, again, we could say, is he to the left and the shot was to the right? Is he either to the right and the shot was to the left? We can debate that, but I still think it's incredibly naive and it comes down to the wording of the law itself and then the interpretation and then the application subsequently of how this this rule is being, or how this law is being obeyed. But I just think it's really tough. I, I think it's really tough. I don't know exactly how to verbalize where I stand in it because not all plays are equal. Some plays are similar. Uh, but to your point, at the end of the day, does the action by the player in an offside position negate the chance of the goalkeeper to make that save? That's something different than, is the player consciously recognizing that a player in an offside position 
is in his frame of reference, and he does have to take into account that player's position in the buildup as he would any of the defenders in front of him. It's r- incredibly complicated. And again, I don't know how they write the rule to interpret it correctly, the law written down, to interpret it and then imply it mm. correctly to where we're not in the same situation where we're saying, is it or isn't it? But that's yeah. pretty much VAR, right? Is it a clear and obvious mistake? Because now we gotta, we, we're starting to get away from, is it correct? Is it factually correct according to the laws of the game? Or is it not a clear and obvious mistake? Because mm. I, I think more and more we're kind of tilting away from what the technology was meant to be applied for. I mean, I just think I always go to the law, look at the play and try and work out what they've done. And I always think it's really interesting, but preventing an opponent from playing or being able to play the ball by clearly obstructing the opponent's line of vision Hmm. whilst being offside, this feels pretty cut and dry to me. And there are debatable ones. And I think the one I mentioned earlier was debatable. And I, I take your point completely that not every action is the same as the next one, despite the same laws being applied. But this feels like it was a huge error to go with a bunch of huge errors in the opening couple of weeks. And I I don't want to do it in a a great length now. Again, it's subjective, but I mean, James Will Prowse handball Friday night. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's handball nine out of 10 games you watch. That's not given. It's not reviewed. You'll watch another one later. And it is, Um, you know, those those ones are one thing. I can't wait to see the clips that Howard Webb and Michael Owen decide to put out tomorrow night. So this is what I was going to say. Wednesday night, um, PGMOL, PGMOL, the Premier League, Premier League Productions with PGMOL and Sky Sports and TNT, and I'm sure it's going to be on NBC somewhere in the US, certainly online. They're doing that kind of uh, mic'd up program for the Premier League. They're going to pick a bunch of games, pick a bunch of decisions, and Howard Webb, I'm sure, is going to tell us how they did it terrifically well. Uh, Dunny, if we're going to learn anything from something like that, don't we have to see the conversation, hear the conversation in this Man City one uh, and and find out exactly where this went wrong and have Howard Webb tell us for our own sanity, but our faith in the system, where it went wrong and how they get it right in the future, as opposed to what we got last time, which was mainly, here's how we got this brilliantly right and here's yeah. how we proved the cause of VAR. Yeah, which we're going to get... I feel like we're probably going to get more of those than we're going to get the ones that are controversial, right? Mm-hmm. They're going to show how the actions on the field led to the conversation with the application of the law, which led to the correct call ultimately being made. Um, and usually that's either overturning or confirming a goal, right? I think the with with, with how the aggre- let's say the aggressiveness, right? The aggressiveness of the English culture and fan base surrounding football. I think you'd almost be better served showing the mistakes, which they'll never do, but showing the mistakes and then the explanation as to why the mistake was made and ultimately where the accountability ended up going, right? The yeah. the referee who messed this up ends up losing the next two games or goes down to the championship for the next two games, something like that. Because at the end of the day, I think the fan the the fans just want to understand that there is accountability for mistakes. We understand that mistakes are made, but is there accountability for mistakes where ultimately Howard Webb and company are making quote unquote apologies to managers immediately after a game or within 48 hours of the game? Um that that that's the difficulty in this conversation of how does he and I think Howard does a great job, don't get me wrong, yeah. but how does he show the fully functioning unit of what VAR is, the functionality of it, the application of it, the explanation of the laws of the game, which is why I think us knuckleheads should lay out and just pipe in the audio immediately. I know the text there, but they're going to say FIFA and IFAB and they'll, they'll, they'll push it somewhere else. But I think that's one of the biggest problems is not just all of these are issues, but the constant evolution of the laws of the game, there's so many people that aren't staying up to date. And then when the application is correct, people are still blo- you know, blowing their tops because they're not understanding of what the laws of the game are, plus they're emotionally invested. So yeah. how does I, I'm I'm really intrigued to see what he chooses on these ones, which ones quote unquote we got right and we'll polish the shiny thing. And then when you got a turd, when you got to polish that turd as well, what that looks like. Yeah, I mean, still show the right ones. I mean, this weekend, Kai Havertz dived at Emirates Stadium, got the Jamie Vardy penalty, and they rightly overturned it. So it's still a good thing, and it can be a good thing. But 
when you do a big balls up, you know, you, you've got to admit to it. Accountability would be great. I mean, in England right now, that the there's roofs on schools that are caving in because of aerated uh, concrete. And the minister for schools said yesterday, shouldn't I get some f***ing praise for how hard I'm working? Sorry, Tim. So, you know, we don't do a great deal of accountability over here. <laughs> um, Danny, final question. We're an international break now. So hopefully next week we'll, we'll do a show after the US men have played a couple of games and England have played Scotland in a 150th anniversary game friendly, which is just... What a waste of time. Um, and I won't do my whole thing uh, in this particular programme, but I might do it for Grumpy Pundits this week because it's so dumb. There's an international break four weeks into the new season. that All they need to do is play all the international games in June or August. We start the season in September. You still get your two months off. There's no way the calendar will be like this if they're starting from scratch. But I won't um, subject you to that in full right now, but get excited for, for whatever show you turn up for this week. Um, but... Talk about the US. They're playing Oman and Uzbekistan. What's the yeah. point? Well, what the point was, there was a heavy rumors that both Brazil and Argentina were going to be in this window. And obviously those didn't work out. Um, I've seen the explanations. Uh, the difficulty to talk about international football now is, number one, how much money can you monetize during the window, right? How can you get either some home field advantage or you can play a big team from around the world? And then ultimately... When you and this is kind of the difficulty for the United States, when you are not going through qualification because you were hosting the World Cup, how can you maybe because you know you have the automatic draw, so you are going to be a part of the World Cup? How can you maybe have an opportunity to experience different regions that you could potentially play, the different federations that you could play um, in the World Cup? So the way that it was explained to us publicly was that Uzbekistan and Oman, as they're getting ready ready for the Asian. Uh, football games tournament. Um, probably didn't say that correctly. Uh, that those are going to be the two teams from the AFC that they're capable of playing, that they 100% know that they'll have that experience before the World Cup comes around in such a short amount of time because it feels like forever, but three years. Um, so this window will be Uzbekistan Oman. Next window in September is going to be Germany and Ghana. So drastically different yeah. uh, size and scale of the matches. Uh, the good thing for Greg Berhalter and his group, for the most part, he has a full roster outside of Tyler Adams and Gio Reyna. What they avoid is the conflict, which is <laughs> this this perception of what is Gio Reyna and Greg Berhalter, which none of us know, none of us understand. And with the quotes of Greg saying he hasn't spoken to Gio yet, makes this conflict resolution situation even more intriguing and confusing. Uh, but short term, I wouldn't say it's a celebration, but international football going or U.S. soccer football going to St. Louis, one of the most iconic historical cities in the United States with regards to American soccer. Uh, you know, when we beat England, there was a bunch of St. Louis people on the team. Uh, so we'll be back there and then to Minnesota for Oman. Uh, intrigued to see the reintegration of Greg Berhalter. How he takes a group that won a CONCACAF Nations League, won a CONCACAF Gold Cup, was the youngest roster to qualify for a World Cup, and was the second youngest roster at the World Cup to qualify for the round of 16, even though they lost to Holland. How they start to create from there after effectively six months of the group creating a growth forward, now Greg coming back in. Um and then in two games where I think the perception is that the United States is so much stronger than Uzbekistan and Oman, style, substance, identity. Those are the three things. I would say the result matters, but almost the eyeball test is more important in these two games. You're expected to win, so how do you win? And how do the players that you expect to be the best performing players on the field by far, how do they showcase what they're capable and the heights that they're capable of 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 doing over those two 90 minute games against Uzbekistan and Oman. Re I'm I'm intrigued to see how it looks like, but I know the expectations are pretty low because of the love of the opponent. And we're going to see you on our TV screens uh, across these games as well. Yeah, I'll be a part of the desk uh with TNT. Um yeah, I'll be with Sarah Walsh, Demarcus Beasley, Luke Wildman, Melissa Ortiz, Kyle Martino. Uh, Shaw Brown will be directing and producing. We'll be uh, we'll 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 be excited about it. We're I'm excited to be back. 
Do and do they make do, do they make you dress like an adult? Do you have, you can you wear, the wear suit? suit. Yeah, you gotta wear, suit. wear a suit. I don't I'm know. Should I, wear the, should I wear the pink again? What, 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 oh, should I do the Liberace? What, you have what, to. What are you feeling? What are you feeling? You have to Liberace for Uzbekistan. You have to. I mean, come on, yeah. Oman. You know, actually, you no. Know, do Oman because we could do some Oman Oman material. Hmm. I'll make something work. Okay. Yeah. All yeah. Right. Because I'll work on it. Yeah. I'll work on it yep. for next show. If okay. you wear the suit, we'll get the chance I to do it. But um. No, probably don't. Danny, always a pleasure, never a chore. That's Brian Dunseth. I'm Tom Rennie. This is Week in the Tackle. Tim Horsey produced the programme. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.